Here are three plastinated bodies. Generally, one side shows the superficial structures while the other deeper structures. In body one, the anterior thoracic and abdominal walls and some organs have been removed to show certain structures. Body two has been divided in the mid-sagittal plane and all the organs have been removed. I'm really pleased with the way the section turned out. This is the first time that I'm able to show the entire length of the male urethra. Body three shows the cartilages, ligaments, and attachments of some of the muscles. Also, the nerves can be followed easily. One upper limb has been separated at the sternoclavicular joint. By the way, clavicle is the only bony connection between the upper limb and the axial skeleton. For this video, I will use mainly body two. For better understanding, do view the structures in the other specimens. Let us start with the osteology. The clavicle is the only bony connection between the upper limb and the axial skeleton. The medial third of the clavicle is convex forwards. The sternal end is much wider as compared to the acromial end. The lateral end inferior surface shows this roughness where the coracoclavicular ligament was attached. On the lateral view of the scapula, note the coracoid process, the acromion process, and the glenoid cavity, which is not very deep. By the way, what deepens the glenoid cavity? It is the glenoid labrum. What would you call the tubercle situated above and below the glenoid cavity? Attached to the supraglenoid tubercle is the long head of biceps, whereas coming from the infraglenoid tubercle is the long head of triceps, and thus these two long heads can act on the shoulder joint. This facet on the acromion is for articulation with the clavicle, and as these two are articulated, Inserting along the clavicle and the acromion and the spine of the scapula is the trapezius. Coming from the same bones but the opposite borders is the deltoid. On the humerus, note the head, lesser, and greater tubercles. Between the two tubercles is the intertubercular groove. On the lateral surface, mid shaft, is this deltoid tuberosity where the deltoid is inserted. On the distal end, note the two condyles. The lateral rounded one is the capitulum and the medial one is the trochlea. It's like a pulley. The lateral epicondyle is much smaller as compared to the medial epicondyle. Lying posterior to the medial epicondyle is the ulnar nerve. The nerve can be rolled and felt in this position. This hollow is the olecranon fossa. Note the radial head, which can be felt in a small depression on the posterior aspect 
of an extended elbow, especially as the forearm is pronated. This is the bicipital tuberosity or the radial tuberosity where the biceps is inserted. On the lateral side, this roughness about mid shaft of the radius is for the insertion of the pronator teres. On the distal end, note the styloid process and the Lister's tubercle or the dorsal tubercle. On the ulna, note the olecranon process, the coronoid process, the ulnar styloid, and the articular facet for the head of the radius. The radius articulates with the ulna at the proximal and the distal radio ulnar joints. In fact, it's at these joints that pronation and supination takes place. This fan-shaped muscle coming from the clavicle, the sternum, and the ribs, and inserting onto the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove is the pectoralis major. You can see part of the pectoralis minor in this region. This is supplied by the pectoral nerves. Its actions are to adduct, medially rotate, and flex the arm. The serratus anterior arises from the upper eight ribs and inserts onto the medial border of the scapula on the costal surface. Here, it is partly covered by these pectoral muscles, and you can note how its fibers interdigitate with those of the external oblique. It protracts the scapula as in pushing and punching, and helps to rotate the scapula, which is essential for abducting the arm more than 90 degrees. It is supplied by the long thoracic nerve. Trapeze means table, and the trapezius from two sides form a table. It extends from the occipital bone, the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, and inserts onto the spine of the scapula, the acromion, and the clavicle. The upper fibers elevate the scapula. The middle fibers brace back. The inferior fibers depress the arm. And the muscle also helps in rotation of the arm for abduction greater than 90 degrees. It is innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. By the way, why is it that your shoulder doesn't sag when you carry a heavy bag on the shoulder? The latissimus dorsi has a very wide origin from the thoracic lumbar vertebrae, the thoracolumbar fascia, and the iliac crest. It's partly covered over by the trapezius at this point. Its fibers go over the angle of the scapula, and sometimes it gets a slip from the inferior angle. Note how these fibers wind around the teres major and then form a narrow tendon which is inserted into the floor of the intertubercular groove. Its actions are to adduct, extend, and medially rotate the arm. Because of its attachment to the vertebrae, it can raise the body as in climbing. It is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve. The scapular muscles seen here are the infraspinatus, the teres minor, the teres major, and the long head of triceps. The scapular muscles have been demonstrated in the shoulder video. This, by the way, is the triangular space. 
here is the deltoid which covers the shoulder like a cape. It takes origin from the clavicle, the acromion, and from the spine of the scapula and is inserted onto the mid shaft of the humerus at the deltoid tuberosity. It's the middle fibers of the deltoid which abduct the arm, whereas the anterior and the posterior fibers stabilize it. In addition, the posterior fibers can extend and laterally rotate, whereas the anterior fibers help the uh, pectoralis major in medially rotating. It is supplied by the axillary nerve. Attached to the coracoid process are the pectoralis minor, the coracobrachialis, and the short head of biceps. Here is the short head of biceps coming down. Joining it is the long head of biceps, forming the tendon or the belly and then the tendon, which is inserted onto the radial tuberosity. And this part here is the bicipital aponeurosis, which fuses with the deep fascia of the forearm. The biceps is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve, and its actions are to flex the elbow and to supinate. Does it have any action on the shoulder joint? Remember, the long head of biceps comes from the supraglenoid tubercle, and hence it can act on the shoulder joint. Another muscle in the anterior compartment of the arm is the brachialis. It comes from the shaft of the humerus and it inserts onto the ulna. Its action is to flex the elbow. Along with the other muscles in the anterior compartment, it is supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. By the way, this is the cephalic vein coming from the dorsal venous arch, and at this point, it lies between the deltoid and the pectoralis major. These two nerves are the medial cutaneous nerves of the arm and the forearm. This here is the median cubital vein connecting the cephalic and the basilic veins. The posterior compartment of the arm is filled by the triceps. It inserts onto the olecranon process. You can see the long head of the triceps as well as the lateral head of the triceps. The medial head of the triceps is situated deeply and is also sometimes called the deep head and is not visible in this specimen. It is innervated by the radial nerve. In fact, this nerve that you're seeing here, little branch coming out, is a branch of the radial nerve on its way to supply the skin on the posterior aspect of the forearm. The actions of the triceps are to extend the elbow, and in addition, the long head also extends the shoulder. The muscles in the posterior compartment of the forearm are extensors of the wrist, thumb, and fingers, as well as supinator and brachioradialis. They are arranged in two groups, the superficial ones that you see here and deep. Most of the superficial muscles originate from the lateral epicondyle, and it is thus called the common extensor origin. Since there isn't enough space on the lateral epicondyle, some of those muscles extend up to the lateral supracondylar ridge. The lateral most muscle in this group is the brachioradialis, which extends from the brachium, the supracondylar ridge, onto the lateral part of the radius just above uh, the radial styloid process. 
it is supplied by the radial nerve and it is an exception to the rule that even though it is in the posterior compartment with the extensors and is supplied by the radial nerve, its action is to flex the elbow and it stands out when the semi-prone forearm is flexed against resistance. I am now holding on to the brachioradialis. In fact, people say it initiates supination of the prone forearm and pronation of the supine forearm. This little nerve, thin nerve, lying on it is the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The next two muscles, this one here and this, are the two radial extensors of the wrist. These are called the extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. They insert onto the second and third metacarpal bases and the difference between the two is that the extensor carpi radialis longus comes from the supracondylar ridge whereas the brevis comes just from the common extensor origin. The extensor digitorum comes from the common extensor origin and divides into four tendons for the four fingers. It forms an extensor expansion over the fingers and it extends at the base of the terminal phalanx. Thus, it can extend all the joints. Can you name the joints? The wrist joint, the metacarpophalangeal joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint, and the distal interphalangeal joint. The next muscle is quite slender and thin and it is just for the little finger. In fact, its belly is fused with that of the extensor digitorum coming from the common extensor origin. But as it comes down, it goes to just the uh, little finger and hence its name extensor digiti minimi. When I move my little finger like this, you can see that this one here is the tendon of the extensor digitorum, whereas this one on the side and a kind of dividing into two is part of the extensor digiti minimi. The last muscle in this group is the extensor carpi ulnaris and that goes to inserts onto the fifth metacarpal. This structure here is the fibrous extensor retinaculum that keeps the extensor tendons in place and actually it has six separate compartments for all these tendons going down into the dorsum. In the deep compartment are four muscles which will be seen in another specimen but I would like to point out some of the tendons seen on the dorsum right here. These this space here is called the snuff box, so called because people used to put snuff in here and inhale or sometimes even put perfume along here because lying in the floor of the snuff box is the radial artery. The lateral boundary of the snuff box is formed by two tendons. This thin long one is the extensor pollicis brevis and this thicker shorter one is the abductor pollicis longus. The medial boundary here is formed by the extensor pollicis longus. The bones that can be felt in the floor of the snuff box are the scaphoid and the trapezium, um for thumb. And you can see here how the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus hooks around this little tubercle that we had mentioned and then changes direction to come like this. These two tendons here, actually you only see one of them, that is the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis brevis. This tendon is an additional tendon that is there for the index finger and that is the tendon of the extensor indices 
it lies medial to the uh, digitation coming from the extensor digitorum. So this is the very own extensor for the index finger. The muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm are the pronator teres and flexors of the wrist, thumb, and fingers. They are also arranged in two groups, superficial and deep. Just like the extensors, most of the superficial muscles come from the medial epicondyle, which is thus called the common flexor origin. The very first muscle coming from that comes across the forearm like this, and it inserts onto the mid shaft of the uh, radius, and the muscle is pronator uh, teres. Teres meaning round, and this is where you're seeing part of it. As I retract these muscles, you can see the entire length of the pronator, and of course, it pronates the forearm. The next muscle coming from the common flexor origin is a flexor on the radial side. So this is the flexor carpi radialis, and it inserts onto the base of the second and the third metacarpals. The next muscle has a very thin belly and a long tendon which goes superficial to the flexor retinaculum and attaches to the palmar aponeurosis. This muscle is the palmaris longus. In fact, this is a phylogenetically degenerating muscle and is often absent in maybe up to 10% of the people. What this does is to deepen the cup of the palm of the hand. And yes, if you say it flexes the wrist, uh, but perhaps it could, but that's not its main uh, function. The next muscle is slightly deep replaced, but it is a flexor of the digits, and hence its num name flexor digitorum. But this is the superficial of the two flexors, and so it is called flexor digitorum superficialis. As it comes down, it divides into four tendons for the four fingers, which insert onto the base of the middle phalanx. We'll follow those in another specimen. Most of the muscles in the forearm are supplied by the median nerve, except for two. This little muscle, well, actually not that little, but uh, coming on the medial side and inserting onto the pisiform or to the base of the uh, fifth metacarpal is the flexor carpi ulnaris. And what do you think would be its nerve supply? Well, it's a flexor muscle on the ulnar side. There is an ulnar nerve, and yes, the ulnar nerve supplies this muscle. This, by the way, is the ulnar artery lying right next to it. And this here, I'm running the pointer over, is the radial artery. In the deep flexor compartment are three muscles, the flexor pollicis longus, the pronator quadratus, and the flexor digitorum profundus. Make sure you see them in another specimen. In this forearm specimen, most of the muscles have been removed to demonstrate the supinator and the pronator quadratus. The supinator over here, you can see how it's winding around the radius, the head of the radius. This little nerve that you see Piercing the supinator is the deep branch of the radial nerve. This, by the way, is the tendon of the biceps, and here is the cut edge of the uh, brachialis. This nerve coming down is the branch of the median nerve called the anterior interosseous nerve as it lies on the interosseous membrane. And this 
little muscle here, quadrangular in shape, and pronates the forearm is hence called the pronator quadratus. In this specimen, let us follow the tendons from the forearm into the hand for orientation. That is the pronator quadratus. This nerve is the median nerve. Here is the ulnar nerve. This is the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis, and this is the flexor carpi ulnaris. This is the cut edge of the flexor retinaculum, so this is the a carpal tunnel. These two muscles are the muscles of the thinner eminence, and these ones that you see deeply, these muscles connecting these metacarpal bones are the interosseae. Actually, what you are seeing, if you looked at the specimen closely, you will appreciate are the dorsal interosseae seen from the palmar aspect. So this tendon over here is the tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus. You see how the tendon of the flexor digitorum superficialis in my left hand splits to let that tendon of the profundus go through it. The superficialis ends at the base of the uh, second phalanx, whereas the profundus goes and inserts into the base of the terminal phalanx. Thus, it is the flexor digitorum profundus which can flex the distal interphalangeal joint in addition to the others. This tendon here is that of the uh, flexor pollicis longus. On the dorsal aspect of the hand, note these two tendons, those of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. This is the extensor pollicis longus coming all the way to the terminal phalanx. And as we put that to one side, uh, these two here are the tendons of the radial extensors, extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. These here are the tendons of the extensor digitorum forming the extensor expansion. This muscle here that I'm following now is the first dorsal interosseus. It's the largest of the interosseae and the action of the dorsal interosseae is to abduct. Remember DAB, D-A-B, the dorsal interosseae abduct the fingers. So this one will abduct the index finger and you try to do yours or anybody's, you can feel this muscle uh, tighten up. This and these are the uh, another interosseae that you can see and these interosseae are inserted into the extensor expansions. Let us see if you can recognize the tendons at my wrist. As I oppose the thumb to the little finger, this tendon that stands out in the middle is that of the palmaris longus. Just lateral to that, this one here, is the flexor carpi radialis, and the one on the medial side here is that of the flexor carpi ulnaris. As I flex my little finger, standing out between these two tendons here is the tendon of the flexor digitorum superficialis. As I turn it, you can see the snuff box, and I'm sure you can uh, recognize or name these tendons. See how this one right here going all the way is flex, uh, sorry, extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and this one here is the uh, abductor pollicis longus. As I extend the wrist, this little bump that stands out, these two, these are the radial extensors, and you can see the tendons of the extensor digitorum. As I extend the index finger while the others are flexed, 
the one that pops out in between these two is the tendon of the extensor indices. This prominence at the base of the thumb is the thinner eminence. Underlying this or it is formed by three muscles. The muscle on the lateral side is the abductor pollicis brevis. The one here lying next to the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus, the muscle is the flexor pollicis brevis and deep to both these and yes you can't see them here but just to explain is the opponent's pollicis. Remember you have only one opponent's which enables you to oppose your thumb to the other fingers. All these three uh, muscles are supplied by a branch of the median nerve. Corresponding to the thinner eminence, right here is the hypothenar eminence formed by three similarly named muscles, those being supplied by the ulnar nerve. <laughs>